Well, good morning, folks. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. If you want to find a seat, we'll go ahead and get started. I know you're always expecting to see Pastor Lou up here, and his smaller sidekick is the one who will be filling in today. So we're grateful that you're here at Rish Community Bible Church with us or watching online through the wonders of the internet. And we're looking forward, even though it's a dreary day outside, we're looking forward to a beautiful time inside as we talk to the Lord through prayer, as we learn from his word, and as we glorify him through music. If you want to take your bulletin, there's a couple upcoming events that are listed here. 
Yesterday, I saw a pretty big crew in the fellowship hall that were involved with the CPR and Lifesaver course, and it looked like it was a success, so if you were part of that, great job. If someone collapses today, we're sending you their direction. Well, pray that doesn't happen, but at least it's good to know we're prepared. Under upcoming events, next Saturday, April 20th, will be men's breakfast at 8 a.m. in the fellowship hall, and then following that, the women's Bible study will be at 10.30. So the men should be wrapped up by then and, um, and out of there, and then the ladies will have their Bible study. And I believe it's the first Bible study in this series. Is that correct, Martha? Okay, so it's, it's starting a new series. So if you weren't able to go to the last women's Bible study and you feel like you don't want to jump in in the middle, well, here's a chance to jump in at the very beginning. So um, that will be next Saturday as well. And then also April 24th, Seniors Group Day of Service. That'll be 10 o'clock here. And so plan for that if you are available and are able to come to that. Obviously, there's a lot to pray for, not only within our church community, but also just in our world in general. In a little bit, we'll have one of our elders come up and, and they will pray. Um, but a few names that we've been praying for, keep praying for the, the people that Pastor Lou mentions almost on a weekly basis. Um, could still definitely use prayer, and even as we see improvement, you just know that the Lord is still working with them. So please keep all of those folks in prayer. I don't have a list of specific names, but they're the names Pastor Lou has been mentioning week to week. With that, go ahead and open your hymnals to page 440, song number 440, and stand with me if you're able to do so. I'm going to send it over to my friend Kevin. He will lead us in the hymn today. Thank you, Kevin. That was a great introduction. Thank you very much. All right, song 440. Follow on. Down in the valley with my Savior I would go Where the flowers are blooming and the sweet waters flow Everywhere he leads me I would follow, follow on Walking in his footsteps till the crown be won. Follow, follow, I would follow Jesus. Anywhere, everywhere, I would follow on. Follow, follow, I would follow Jesus. Everywhere he leads me, I would follow on verse 2 down in the valley with my savior i would go where the storms are sweeping and the dark waters flow with his hand to lead me i will never never fear danger cannot fright me if the lord is near Follow, follow, I would follow Jesus Anywhere, everywhere, I would follow on Follow, follow, I would follow Jesus Everywhere he leads me, I would follow on down in the valley or upon the mountain steep close beside my savior would my soul ever keep he will lead me safely in the path that he has trod up to where they gather on the hills of god follow follow I would follow Jesus anywhere, everywhere. I would follow on, follow, follow. I would follow Jesus everywhere he leads me. I would follow on. If you join me for prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning just so thankful for the rain that you provided, just the beauty that we've had the last few days, and Lord, we know that your, your hand is upon it all. We thank you for having a 
great church that we can come to each Sunday and, and even in the midweek, Lord, where we can uh, worship you. And we just are so thankful for that. Lord, for all of those in our congregation that have illnesses, some with cancer, some with, uh, yeah, just so many things, Lord. We just pray that you would deal with each and every one that has that. Reach your hand down and touch them, Lord, if it be your will, and, and heal them. But, Lord, just for seeing us through colds and flus and things that uh, none of us enjoy, but you just, you walk us through it. We're so thankful, Lord. Ask that you would be with Kevin this morning as he brings a message. Pray our hearts would be opened and that not one would leave here today without having that confirmed knowledge of you. We just thank you for your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Before you're seated, take a moment, say hi to someone, greet someone, and then we'll get started with worship in a minute. Some glad morning when this life is o'er, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away. I'll fly away, oh glory. I'll fly away. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. The shadows of this life that broke, I'll fly away. Like a bird from prison bars that's flown, I'll fly away. Hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. Just a few more weary days and then I'll fly away. To a land where joy shall never end, I'll fly away. Glory, I'll fly away when I die. Hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. I'll fly away, oh, I'll fly away when I die. Hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. Great singing. You'll notice our songs today all have something to do with the ultimate hope, the blessed hope, which is what our message is on today, and the greatest hope of all, which is to see Jesus face to face someday. 
how lovely is your dwelling place O Lord Almighty for my soul longs and even faints for you for here my heart is satisfied within your presence I sing beneath the shadow of your wings better is one day in your courts better is one day in your house better is one day in your courts and thousands elsewhere better is one day in your courts better is one day in your house better is one day in your courts and thousands elsewhere than thousands elsewhere one thing I ask and I would see to see your beauty to find you in the place your glory dwells one thing I ask and I would see to see your beauty to find you in the place your glory dwells better is one day in your courts better is one day in your house better is one day in your courts and thousands elsewhere better is one day in your courts better is one day in your house better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere than thousands elsewhere my heart and soul cry out for you the living God you one rich water to my soul I've tasted and I've seen come once again to me I will draw near to you I will draw near to you better is one day in your courts better is one day in your house better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere better is one day in your courts better is one day in your house better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere than thousands elsewhere only imagine what it will be like when I walk by your side I can only imagine when your eyes will see when your face is before me I can only imagine I can only imagine Surrounded by your glory What will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in awe of you be still? Will I stand in your presence? Or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. Yeah, I can only imagine. I can only imagine when that day he comes and I find myself standing in the sun. 
can only imagine when all I will do is forever forever worship you I can only imagine I can only imagine Surrounded by your glory What will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence? Or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. Yeah, I can only imagine. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in awe of you be still? Will I stand in your presence? Or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. Yeah. I can only imagine I can only imagine what it will be like when I walk by your side I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me only imagine I can only imagine you may be seated kids and youth may head downstairs I love that song that we just sang. I can only imagine. It's pretty hard to think of what it's going to be like. We don't have any idea. We don't have anything to relate it to, except it's going to be glorious. We know that. This is a uh, this is a com composition. I put these two songs together. One is beneath the cross, and then the old rugged cross.
That was beautiful, Lillian. Thank you. The conflict in Gaza now entering its sixth month. The Israeli operation to root out Hamas terrorists there has resulted in the deaths of 30,000 Palestinians and 242 Israeli soldiers. The war started after Hamas attacked Israel on October 7th, killing almost 1,200 people and taking nearly 230 hostage, some still in captivity. Despite the deadly outcome across the region, one trigger for the Hamas rampage has been widely overlooked. Chris Livesay has the story from Jerusalem. The infamous October 7 massacre that sparked a war. But one confounding yet eye-opening motive has escaped the headlines. In a recent speech, a Hamas spokesman blamed the Jews for bringing red cows to the Holy Land. The cows he's talking about at a secure, undisclosed location are these. Red heifers, to be precise. Some Jews and Christians believe they're the key to rebuilding the historic Jewish temple in Jerusalem and to beckoning the Messiah. To understand, you have to go back nearly 2,000 years when the ancient Romans destroyed the last temple in the city. To rebuild it, these believers point to the Bible's Book of Numbers. It commands the Israelites to sacrifice a red heifer without defect or blemish, and that has never been under a yoke. Only then can the temple rise again. Caring for them on an Israeli settlement in the West Bank is Yitzhak Mamo. So we have here, uh, after a long research we find in uh, Texas. In Texas? Uh, yeah, yeah, Texas, United States of America. Texas Red Angus flying them 7,000 miles to Israel. This is not a publicity stunt. Well, what do you mean? Meaning, <laughs> this is something you take very seriously. Harry Potter is a good story. The Bible is not story. The Bible is a way of God to lead us. Is that big, Jim? But a massive altar already awaits where the heifers are to be burned. According to some believers, the ceremony needs to be performed right here on the Mount of Olives, looking directly into where the temple once stood. But something else now stands in its place. The Dome of the Rock and Al-Aqsa Mosque, among the holiest sites in Islam. Today, only Muslims are allowed inside, but that's not stopping Jewish activists outside. Once you got, you started here. When October 7th happened last year, knew that the justification for it was the presence of red heifers being brought into Israel from Texas, of all places. In fact, the operation was called the Al-Aqsa operation because of the Al-Aqsa Mosque there on, on the Temple Mount. So, I used that as an illustration of the world that we, we are in. And several weeks ago, I had a message planned, and the Lord kind of tapped me on the shoulder and said, I want you to talk about this other thing. And I said, no, that's controversial. That'll get people kind of torqued at me. What are you talking about? And the Lord said, no, I want you to talk about the blessed hope of the believer and to, to orient our eyes towards the Lord, no matter what's going on. And then, yesterday, I'm here at the church working on finalizing my my message, and all of a sudden, Iran fires off 300 missiles, drones, cruise missiles at Israel. And I'm feverishly updating what I'm doing because it has become so timely because of the world that we live in. So, I want to start with this idea that there may be times as I'm sharing, and I'm not going to have as much levity or, you know, sometimes I try to inject humor, but I want you to recognize the focus on the word hope. Hope. It's all throughout God's word, and I especially want it to saturate this message because the blessed hope of the believer, as spoken of in Titus, is, is the thing that will get us through hard times. So if you want to open with me, our text is Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. I've also put it at the top of the bulletin um, page in my notes as well, so you're welcome to read it off of that. But I want to start by reading this verse. And then I'm going to tell you why I think hope around this 
kind of subject matter is so important. I remember the first time I visited Rush Community Bible Church after we moved here, Pastor Ron was doing a sermon series on Revelation, and it was so encouraging to hear God, God's word and God's heart through how Pastor Ron was sharing about the hope of the believer that's in some of those, those parts of the Bible that are sometimes a little bit dark, maybe overwhelming. So bear that in mind as we're, as we're going through this today. But here is that passage, Titus chapter 2, 11 through 13. And it says this, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That blessed hope, the blessed hope of the believer. Now, you may not have always, whenever people discuss things about the end times or prophecy, you may not have always had the most hopeful sense about it. And I'll tell you why I didn't. I grew up in the 80s and the 90s when books like How Lindsay's Late Great Planet Earth were popular or 88 Reasons Jesus Will Come in 1988. Some of you remember that book. But more than that, on the youth camp circuit, and I went to youth camp for nine summers, there was a propensity to show movies that I felt like maybe were kind of designed to scare people into wanting to follow the Lord. And so I grew up watching A Thief in the Night, A Distant Thunder, Years of the Beast, The Prodigal Planet, those kinds of movies, and they were frankly terrifying. There were scenes and images that I saw when I was a kid that I shouldn't have seen because they terrified me. And I kind of thought, this is you know, what people mean when they talk about studying Bible prophecy. It was only when I grew up and was old enough to understand why God put all that prophecy in the Bible that it was meant to encourage us and to edify us. And it took me until I was a grown-up to really recognize that. It's a blessing that prophecy is in there. So let me first mention why we study Bible prophecy, and then we're just going to look at a few specific things. They're in your notes. Um, there's three main points that I want to, to drive us towards. First, God has given us a future to look forward to. That's the first bullet point there on your outline. Second, Jesus told his followers what to expect, and he did so for a reason, to assuage our fears, to put our worries to rest, not to make them more dramatic or worry us more. And then lastly, the greatest part of that hope that Titus mentions, Jesus is coming back for us someday. So why do we study Bible prophecy? Most people, I think, think of Bible prophecy like this. Kind of a convoluted mess, and you're trying to figure out what do these seven seals mean, and why does that come out of this, and what's the dragon, all these different things. And, and people can be, really be interested, and I think there is something um, important and valuable about studying prophecy, but we don't usually know exactly what prophecy means until it's fulfilled. Jesus fulfilled so many prophecies, and yet they weren't obvious until after he had fulfilled them in many cases. What prophecy actually is, though, is this passage from the very beginning of Revelation. There's no other book in the Bible that promises a special blessing for those who read it. And it says this, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it, and take to heart what is written in it because the time is near. Now, if John wrote that on the island of Patmos, you know, in 80, 90, or 92, uh, almost 2,000 years ago, the time must be nearer now. So does that cause us to worry and fret and become concerned? Or does it instead cause us to look up? Look up for redemption draws nigh. Now, there are benefits to studying prophecy. That verse says you will be blessed if you do it, but also... There's a few other things. One, it authenticates the Bible. When you can point to Micah who says the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem, this tiny little town outside of Jerusalem, nobody was born in Bethlehem, I mean, other than David. So I guess it was an important city in that sense, but it was kind of like what Jacksonville is to Medford, right? But the Bible said he will be born there to the point that Herod asked all the scholars, where will this Messiah guy be so I can try to wipe him out in the crib? Number two, 
There's assistance in spreading the gospel. When you can show the authenticity of God's word through any number of means, there are some people who will latch on to that or will recognize God's word because of the things that over history have been re revealed. And there's evidence. You can actually look at the writings of Daniel and it predicts the very the very Palm Sunday Jesus would ride into Jerusalem. And I'm not going to get that deep in the weeds today, but just know that it can help you in spreading the gospel to show how authentic God's word is. And then third, and this is also mentioned in that, in that Titus in passage, it says it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. It's an encouragement of holy living. It's an encouragement, if we know that the Lord could come back in our lifetime, it's something that says, hey, I want to make sure that I'm ready and that I'm following the Lord the way I should be. And so here's that, that prophecy once again from Revelation 1-3, that God blesses those. This is from the New Living Translation. God blesses the one who reads this prophecy to the church, and he blesses all who listen to it and obey what it says, for the time is near when these things will happen. So... We should not be fearful, and even though I'm, I'm going to look at just a few specific things that are mentioned in, in the Bible as far as prophecies, but I want to make sure we always turn it back to hope. This is that thing that gives us hope that the Lord's return could even be uh, it soon, very soon. His return is mentioned, Jesus' return is mentioned 1,845 times throughout the Bible, and 1,527 of them are in the New Testament. Um, the Old Testament, and 318 are in the New Testament. For every reference to the Messiah's first coming that we see throughout the Old Testament, there are eight references to his second coming. That suggests to me this is an important thing that God wanted us to understand. And over 50 times, different times, the Bible tells us, be ready for his return. Jesus said, I come as a thief in the night. Um, I come when, you know, when people aren't expecting. So, to be just ready at all times. And so, I, I did mention um, in the Old Testament, there's a lot about prophecy, but one thing that is very interesting to me, and yesterday really drove this point home, is just the existence of Israel, the nation of Israel. I've read some old books that were written in the 1800s about Bible commentary, and they all mention the idea of Israel ever becoming a nation as kind of a, well, that's just a metaphor for God's church, and, and there was no concept that Israel might become a nation someday. But back in the time of Deuteronomy, you know, 1,400 years before the coming of Christ or so, in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses wrote about the nation of Israel, and you shall become an astonishment, a proverb, and a byword among all nations where the Lord will drive you. Even at that early point, there was an understanding, a suggestion that if Israel did not follow God, he was going to send them into exile. And that's what happened, first with the Assyrians in the 700s BC, and then later with the Babylonians with the southern kingdom. And they were taken and spread throughout the world of that time. But Israel, to this day, remains God's clock. It's the way that he, he looks at the universe through the lens of his promised people. And um, there's, I'm, I'm not going to go really deep into this, but there are some things dealing with Israel and that's why it was really interesting yesterday to watch these things happening as I was preparing you know, to talk about this, this thing that I'd planned weeks ago. Um, Daniel mentions that there are 70 weeks, 77, 70 times 7, that are determined upon your people and upon your holy city. And it, it, it kind of goes into a little bit more detail for why to bring everlasting righteousness and all this stuff. And it basically um, predicts to the very weak where Jesus would ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. And so God has throughout, throughout time, and if you look at the Bible, there's many examples. I, I don't have time to go into all of them, but just know that God has used Israel for judging other nations, but also to try to get them to turn their eyes back to him. In the Old Testament, God preserved Israel for a 1,500-year period, despite the fact that they were a tiny little nation sandwiched between the superpowers of Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, all those nations. And then, of course, the, the Romans, the most powerful empire of that day, got so angry at them in 70 AD that they completely wiped out the Temple Mount, destroyed the temple to fulfill Jesus' prophecy, and uh, renamed the city to, to do everything they could to disassociate it from Israel. Yet, on May 14, 1948, 
the nation of Israel was reborn. And this was a, such a miracle that if you read Bible commentaries written about that time, they're kind of like perplexed and like, we never thought that this was really going to happen. But in 1948, Israel became a nation. On the second day that they were a nation, all of their Arabic neighbors attacked them, tried to push them into the sea, and Israel won that war, and then won a war in 1956, and won a war in 1967, and 1973, and 1982, and 2006. All these things that have happened, um, all these things that have happened are prophetic fulfillment of God's preservation of his people. And there's a few other things. Daniel didn't just mention this whole idea of basically the coming of the Messiah and from the time that this declaration would be remade to build the, or made to rebuild the city. But he also mentioned other things that we could expect. And um, one verse that you may have heard before, I've heard this a lot because it references the time we live in. Daniel was told by God, many will run to and fro, travel all around the world, which was a very unusual thing. It's expected that Jesus never went more than maybe 50 miles from where he was born in his whole 33 years on this earth. Um, and knowledge shall be increased. Has knowledge been increased in our lifetime? For our youth group last Wednesday, I was doing a message on deception and how to understand deception. And using an AI tool, I wrote a, a brand new worship song from scratch. I played it for him. I kind of joke, you know, halfway said, yeah, you know, maybe you've heard this on, on uh, you know, um, K-Love or something like that. And, you know, and they listened and they just thought it was a total real legit thing. And it was just a song I had manufactured out of, out of the air because of the level of technology we have with artificial intelligence and things like that. So that was all predicted into the time that, that, we, that we live today. But if you look at that first point here on, the, on your outline, it says God has given us a future to look forward to. We do not need to be fearful of these things. And the verse that I love that illustrates this verse, or, or this idea, is that verse from Jeremiah. And I, I've used it as a Christian school teacher. I've used it in all sorts of settings because it is such a nice reminder that God wants what is best for us. He wants a bright, positive future, um, even at times when it seems like there's darkness around. And this is the verse specifically that I always pivot to when I'm thinking about hope. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. If the Lord wanted us to be worried and perplexed and freaking out like the world is doing right now, and I'm sure on all the Sunday morning shows, the topic of conversation is Iran's attack on Israel yesterday. Um, if God wanted us to do that, he would not have given us so many reminders I have good plans for you. I am watching out for your future. I am going to be with you no matter what happens. And Jesus himself in, chapter, in John, the Gospel of John 14.1 said, let not your heart be troubled. Don't be troubled. There are 365 verses in the Bible that speak to fear not, fear not, don't be in fear. So even as we look at some of these things with um, ancient prophecies that potentially are forming up to be fulfilled in our lifetime, we don't need to be fearful. And so I want to kind of pivot. So let's look at a little Bible prophecy that's in the headlines today. Okay. Now, again, I planned this a few weeks ago, and obviously um, developments have, have happened. Um, but Bible prophecy in today's headlines. There was an earthquake a week or so ago in New York, New York doesn't get a lot of earthquakes, but New York had an earthquake. It was very strange. Um, I said there'd be a little levity. Here's an example. Um, it wasn't so traumatic and tragic that it was massively destructive, but it was still strange. And when we look at Jesus' words in Matthew 24, where he says there'll be earthquakes in many places, you kind of go, huh, New York? That's not on the ring of fire or on a fault line or anything like that. So... That was one thing that happened recently, but more the elephant in the room right now is what happened yesterday in Israel. I took that picture from the Israel red alert system they have where they predict the falling of missiles from Hezbollah or Hamas or whatever, and this was yesterday. They, they had alerts everywhere. I've never seen anything like it. I sometimes kind of halfway pay attention to things going on. And yesterday, pretty much the whole country was blanketed in these alerts of where there was, there was worry and fear that missiles and bombs and things would fall. Now, the, the interesting thing about Iran 
being part of this, and Iran forming this coalition that they're currently um, developing with Russia and some of their, their surrounding um, you know, kind of partners, strategic partners they're forming up with, is the Bible predicts in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 38 and 39, a coalition of nations coming against Israel. And we'll look at that in a moment. But Iran is specifically mentioned as one of them under its old name Persia. It was called Persia till the 70s. Um, and the fact that it would be one of the nations mentioned in the Bible that's part of this alliance against Israel attacking was one of those things where I'm like, oh, look, I'm literally reading my Bible yesterday in my office here, and I'm reading verses and looking, you know, on the computer to kind of see things that seem to correlate. One thing I found extremely interesting is yesterday, I, took, I got this picture off of a video, and there were missiles right over the Dome of the Rock Mosque on the Temple Mount. Now, supposedly Iran wants to, you know, liberate Jerusalem and, and you know, whatever, um, but they were firing missiles that were in, in uh, potentially range of destroying the Dome of the Rock Mosque on the Temple Mount. So what they were doing had potentially catastrophic uh, effects even on the things that they say that they stand for. And I just found that a striking image. I can almost picture seeing this in history books years from now because this was such an unusual thing. Um, other pictures I found of, of rockets landing, you know, first they, they sent drones, suicide drones, and then they sent cruise missiles, and then they sent ballistic missiles. And I was, you know, watching this happen, and I'm like, this is so weird to be studying to share about prophecy and why it's actually a blessed hope and seeing historical events play out in, in front of me. Um, the Bible mentions in Ezekiel 38 and 39 this coalition, and it mentions the nation to the uttermost north of Israel. Well, if you go to the uttermost north of Israel, it's basically Russia. And Russia has been buying these drones from Iran and using them in Ukraine. So we're seeing this alliance come together. There's some other Arabic nations that are also mentioned in this coalition. And, and you might look at this and say, I don't want to see that kind of stuff happen in my lifetime. But this should bring us hope. And the reason I keep coming back to that is because Jesus told us in advance so that for the very purpose that we wouldn't worry, we wouldn't be concerned like other people that have no hope. There's also a, a couple other passages that relate to whatever all this stuff is that we're seeing form up. There's a war mentioned in Psalm 83, and it mentions all of the neighbors right around Israel. And now, some of those nations may not have a one-to-one -one correspondence with current nations, but we know the territories they were on and roughly what countries that they, that they um, refer to or relate to. And so there's this other conflict that's mentioned in Psalm 83, and um, it could be the same conflict as Ezekiel 38 and 39, just kind of looked looking a little bit closer to Israel's territory. But it could also be, you know, another potential conflict. But we see those same alliances forming up in our world today. The same countries that are basically saying we're aligning ourselves in an alliance against Israel. We're, we're seeing that develop in a way that matches the biblical account. The other thing we're seeing that is, is kind of um, a little bit weird to me is there's this prophecy in Isaiah 17. And, and a month or so ago, I was opening to do devotions, and I just wanted some light, you know, fluffy kind of um, thing. And I opened to this, this verse, and it was like the Lord, not in a weird way, but like I felt like, you know, pointed at this, this passage, and I'm like, why in the world am I seeing this? But it, basically it says this, a prophecy against Damascus. See, Damascus will no longer be a city, but will become a heap of ruins. Well, Damascus is one of the, if not the oldest, continuously inhabited city from ancient times. It's mentioned in the Old Testament. Uh, if you remember the story of Naaman the leper, uh, he wanted to go back to Damascus to bathe in those waters because they were a lot cleaner than the nasty, muddy Jordan River. Um, it's mentioned when, when Saul was on his way there with a bunch of papers to arrest the Christians there, and, and Jesus, you know, blinded him and confronted him on the road. Damascus is a very ancient city, but God's word says in Isaiah 17, a time will come where it will no longer be a city. Well, yesterday, Israel carried out some some um, raids and bombs, bombing runs on Damascus, and with all the other stuff going on, I 
I could see that prophecy developing tomorrow and it wouldn't be a surprise because Syria's regime under um, Assad has very much you know, been part of that coalition with Russia and Iran against Israel. Remember, Israel's this tiny little nation, about one eleventh the size of Oregon. How can this tiny little country be the thing that causes the world so much consternation? Well, God told us it would be like that. And, um, and he also said, when you see this stuff happening, have hope. Don't fear, don't worry, don't doubt. Um, what's interesting also about that Ezekiel 38, 39 passage is God tells Ezekiel what the outcome will be. Israel's going to be invaded by that coalition someday. And if it happened tomorrow, I would not be surprised. Um, let's, in my own sense, I'm, I'm hoping and praying, of course, that's not the case. But um, when those nations attack Israel, there will be four main things that happen. One, there will be a giant earthquake that will hit the land. It will cause panic. The invading armies will basically start attacking each other like they did in the story of, of Gideon when they broke the pitchers and had the torches and it freaked everyone out. And also the story of Elisha. There's a part where the guys end up um, retreating because they hear what sounds like chariots and they're freaking out and everything. So there's going to be so much confusion they're going to end up attacking each other. Pestilence will break out upon the invading armies. We don't know exactly what, but something, Ezekiel says. And then finally, fire, brimstone, and hail will rain down upon them from on high. Now, it could literally be natural disaster type um, fire and brimstone and hail. But what do those missile landings and, and uh, when they hit the ground and the explosions kind of look like? They kind of look like fire and brimstone raining from heaven. So, you know, I don't know. Maybe that's a metaphorical way that Bible's describing uh, this conflict that's going to happen. I don't know. It may just be God putting a judgment where there's fire and brimstone and hail. But I watched this yesterday. 300 different projectiles from Iran, um, you know, trying to make their way to attack Israel. Some were, a lot of them were shot down by Jordan, um, by Great Britain. They... Uh, had some planes in Cyprus that flew over there to, to confront and shoot down some of them. The United States, we shot down a bunch of them. In fact, we, our country spent about $1.1 billion yesterday to shoot down projectiles so they wouldn't hit Israel. Israel spent about $110 million themselves with their arrow system, their David sling system, and with their um, Iron Dome system. But we saw something that kind of feels in a way like it, it could match some of the descriptions that we see in the Bible. I'm not saying that that's the thing. I'm just saying it makes it make a little more sense. Things I've read since I was a kid that didn't make sense now are starting to feel a little more clear to me. One other thing that's interesting is uh, a number of years ago I was reading an article and this was when Hezbollah attacked Israel in 2006. And they were quoting some of these operatives for Hezbollah in southern Lebanon saying, well, it's not fair because we'll fire a missile and something will just knock it off course without any explanation. We don't know why. Their God is you know, always um, messing up our rockets in midair and things like that. It's just one of those things where like, God is going to protect Israel. He promised he would. He who watches over Israel doesn't slumber or sleep. So when we see those things happen around us, again, it should give us hope, not worry. Now, this, the second bullet point says, Jesus told his followers what to expect. And I want to read what I wrote there. I wrote this for a reason. Jesus cared enough about us to tell us not, I underlined and made it big, to worry, not to worry, when he gave us a preview of the future during the Olivet Discourse. If you remember, Jesus was up on the Mount of Olives, and one of his disciples said, tell us what the end is going to be like. And Jesus is looking out over the temple, and the first thing he basically tells them, he says, this beautiful temple that you see, the most illustrious thing that, that King Herod built, that basically was more grand than, than um, Solomon's initial temple, all of this will be thrown down. Not one stone will still be on another. Well, about 40 years after Jesus gave this prophecy on the Mount of Olives, the Romans, after besieging the city under General Titus, came into the city and they lit the, church, the temple on fire, and as the gold melted and went down between the bricks, the Roman soldiers tore apart to get at the gold and fulfilled this literally. So Jesus is looking out at the temple as he's saying this. And then he says, here's some things that are going to happen in the end times. 
And I'm going to go point by point through them, and I want you to just on each one kind of mentally check, have we seen any of those kinds of things happen in, in our time, perhaps? So this, you can find this in Matthew 24. It's, there's a parallel account in Luke 21, and then a, a shorter kind of abridged version in Mark 13. But three of the Gospels, all three of the synoptic Gospels, chose to refer to this thing Jesus talked about because they thought it was important. So I'm just going to go point by point through each of these. Um, and then I'm going to remind you what Jesus said in, in um, the passage where he said, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, we heard of wars and rumors of wars yesterday. Do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. So I'm just going to go point by point on the things Jesus talked about. And I want to remind us he told us these things for a reason, to put our heart at rest, not to make us get alarmed and worked up about it. They've asked, you know, evangelical pastors, you know, basically, have you seen some of the things Jesus talked about um, happen in your time in ministry? And, and these are the percentages. Rise of false prophets and false teachings, 83%. Love of many believers growing cold, 81%. Traditional morals becoming less accepted, 79%. Wars and national conflicts, 78%. I imagine that's 90-some percent today. Um, uh, let's see, um, earthquakes and other natural disasters, 76%. The number of people abandoning their Christian faith, 75%. Famines, 70%. Anti-Semitism towards the Jewish people worldwide, 63%. I imagine that's probably higher as well. Um, and so most pastors who have studied these sorts of things correlate what they're seeing in the news with, with the things that the Bible says. So the first thing Jesus mentioned if you want to turn over there with me and go point by point, you're welcome to, Matthew 24. The first thing he says is, watch out that no one deceives you. This is verse 4 of chapter 24. Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you. And then the next part says, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah and will deceive you. But that first sub-sentence he says, watch out that no one deceives you. Do we have deception in our world today? Oh yeah, have you ever seen a time with more deception? Have you ever seen a time when you even know what's true? The last four years with the COVID stuff, do you know what's true about COVID four years later? Do you know what's true about, you know, so many of those kinds of things? We don't know because there is such a spirit of deception in our world, and that's what Jesus said. But he said it would go beyond that. He said it would go beyond to the point where there would be people convincing others that they were the Messiah. And I don't know, most of you probably remember, you know, things ranging from um, back in 1997, I remember, there was this comet, Comet hale -Bopp. And I don't know if you remember, the, there was a cult. They all wore the white Nike shoes, and they all ended up committing suicide together because they believed that their Messiah, um, basically what he was telling them to do, that they would be raptured up to this giant spaceship. And, you know, that's just one example. Jonestown, there's many, many examples. Um, there, there's so much of this that we almost turn a blind eye to it today. There are things that pull people's attention or maybe they, they follow certain leaders on, they see on TV or whatever. This is definitely present in our world. And it feels, if anything, like it's growing stronger because people are questing for something. They're looking for someone to turn to. And if they don't turn to Jesus they're going to put their, their attention on someone who is a, a false messiah, who's going to pull them away from Jesus. Another thing he mentions in the next verse, and we've already kind of touched on this, but he says, wars and rumors of war. So this is in verse um, 6. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. That reminder, there's hope. Don't be alarmed. Don't worry about these things. Um, such things must happen, but the end is, is yet to come. So yesterday, wars and rumors of wars. We're here in Little Roosh, Oregon. We're not directly observing and seeing these things. But in Egypt, in the West Bank, in um, the Gaza Strip, in Lebanon, Syria, people are sharing videos on social media of missiles flying over their heads. In um, Iraq, people are sharing missiles. In Jordan, people have found missiles that got shot down, and there are these giant cylinders sitting on the ground with Iranian uh, writing on them um, and number systems and things. So we're hearing and seeing this in a way I don't think we've ever seen. And I grew up 
the Gulf War in 1991. You know, 9-11, I had just graduated high school and gotten married. Um, really bad timing to have a natural disaster, you know, like that or something that became one of those where were you, kind of like John F. Kennedy's assassination in 1963 or Pearl Harbor were for previous generations. 9-11, people know where they were um, because of wars and rumors of wars. 9-11 happened in New York, but even here in Roosh, Oregon, we were affected by it. And sometimes you hear things, and it can be easy to, to become trepidatious or worried. But Jesus said right here, um, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is not yet. Famine. Now, I put a little chart there on the side. Um, it says, COVID exacerbates world hunger. And it talks about how the last few years, the, the change in how distribution systems operate and different things has actually, in parts of the world, caused a great increase in hunger. Now, right now, we can still go to the grocery store and buy things off the shelf and you know, pretty much get anything you want. Chocolate's gone up a little bit. I'm not happy about that. But um, it's still you know, a pretty good time in that regard. But Jesus said, you will see famine in the world. And there is famine in the world, even if it isn't necessarily right here uh, on our shores necessarily. Um, he talked about earthquakes in many places. And I know I kind of made a joke about New York. They had an earthquake and they're like, what is this? Because they don't get those very often. Um, and it wasn't a huge deal. But there was also an earthquake recently in Taiwan. And that picture in the upper right where it shows the building tilted over, that was in Taiwan. And if you've seen any video from that, there were people driving in their cars and the roads like jumping all over and, you know, weird crazy things. Um, we here live along the, the, where the Pacific Plate meets, meets the North American Plate, and there's also the Juan de Fuca Plate. And every few hundred years, there's a massive earthquake that hits this part of the world. It hasn't happened since the year 1700, but it is possible in our lifetime we will experience a major earthquake here. So Jesus said, you will, you will see these things. This is verse 7. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Sometimes when they happen closer together, you get a little more nervous. And that's where it's more important to go back to hope. Jesus said, I'm telling you this stuff so you will have hope and you will not be fearful. How about disease? Jesus mentions, um, he mentions pestilence and disease. Well, we just had four years of the, of the weirdest of our lifetime, disease, if you will, um, I read a book right before COVID hit. I read this book about the 1918 influenza epidemic. My grand grandma, who um, in 1927, they bought a homestead out here in Roosh. Um, but I had asked her when I was a kid, because I'd heard about this thing, about the, you know, the flu. And they called it the Spanish flu, even though it was, it was uh, initially, apparently in a Kansas military camp where it really kind of had its breakout. Um, and it killed millions and millions of people. And you know, that was just a historical thing. Well, then the last four years with COVID, and now the thing I'm seeing hyped up a lot in the news is bird flu. Bird flu has crossed into mammals. There's cows in, in um, eight states, I think, that now apparently have been infected with bird flu. And you almost feel like it's being ramped up, kind of like maybe past things were. And I look at that and I start to get worried and, and kind of doubtful. And then I look back to what Jesus said. And I'm reminded that Jesus said, I'm telling you these things so that you won't get worried. I'm telling you these things so that you will have hope. Um, there's talk in, in what he says. He says in verse 9, Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. Well, these are nations right now that are the, the, the top countries that are having Christian persecution. Um, Obviously, some are in places where there's other religions that are, are very much not welcoming of the Christian faith. And then even some in our hemisphere, you wouldn't think Mexico, Colombia would necessarily be the case. But what's interesting is in all those places where there's the most oppression against the Christian faith, those are the places where you see house churches and you see people springing up in, in response and you see God's word being shared. And it's amazing how God uses even that kind of persecution to grow and reach, to reach people. And um, there's one very intriguing thing that Jesus said, and it's verse 14. And this has always kind of been a little, it tickles my brain somehow because 
I feel like we're almost there. And it says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Well, not very long ago, we had the Wycliffe Bible translators come. And they're feverishly trying to translate God's word into, you know, some of these languages that don't have it. And I saw yesterday as I was reading, there, there was an estimate that by 2025, they expect they will have at least a portion of the scriptures, um, translations in every, every major language or language group um, that, that we know of. And so, you know, it's one of those, huh, well, that's interesting that Jesus tagged that on there and mentioned that. But again, he's telling us, and that's a good thing, right? That the gospel be preached throughout the world. That's a good thing. But he's saying, um, this all has to happen. And then he ends that verse 14, and then the end will come. One other thing that, that um, he mentioned, and this was a little bit, a couple of, uh, verses earlier, he said, and because lawlessness or wickedness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. And there's the part where the love of many will grow cold as far as Christians who will kind of walk away or step away from the, the faith that was their, their first love. But there's also just a general sense in the world. And I picked just one example, but I could have picked several. In New York City right now, there's an epidemic of women just getting punched randomly for no reason. You're like, what? What is that about? And here's, there's a headline that says, women in New York City are getting randomly punched in the face and no one knows why. Okay, that's kind of weird. Um, this is a gentleman named Daniel Penny. He was on a New York um, train, one of the subways, and the guy was trying to attack people, and he grabbed the guy, held him in a headlock, and if I remember the story correct, the guy passed away, but it was, you or I would probably say that was a self-defense thing. Well, in New York City, they're throwing the book at him and basically making it where nobody wants to stand up for anybody else. Nobody wants to intervene and interject and spend the rest of their life in prison for trying to protect a stranger, and so it makes sense as the love of many, just the normal love you have, the decency for how we treat people is whack, is waning and kind of dissipating, that you would have people thinking it's okay to just randomly go and clock someone in the face. Um, and so this is just one example that I look at when I see that verse that says, because lawlessness will abound, it seems like in major cities right now, people can go rob a store and there's no repercussions. People can go assault someone, there's no repercussions. Well, does that maybe then make people, other people cynical and say, well, then I don't want to help anybody. I don't want to do anything. Um, I don't know exactly maybe what that, that verse means as far as what Jesus's original intent was, but the fact that we are seeing clear signs of the love of many waxing cold or, you know, basically people stopping to just show the normal decent human interaction that, that we would expect in society. And so we're seeing a lot of that. But all those things, all these things that Jesus warned about, they bring us to the main point I think that he had for us. This is the third bullet point on your outline. It says, Jesus has promised he's coming back for us. If all we had were these other two bullet points, yes, God has given us a future to look forward to, and Jesus told us what to expect so we wouldn't worry. If that's all we had, we would still be in a pretty rough spot because we would not have hope. Yeah, we know about it, but we don't have any hope about what to do with, it, with that knowledge. So this is perhaps the most important thing, which is why it's in black on a white background, is Jesus is coming back. He's not planning to just leave us. It is not his purpose for us to have part in the wrath that the Bible says that is to come. Um, on your bulletin, I put the verse from Acts chapter 1. This is after Jesus went into heaven and what the, the angel said. So it says this, Acts um, chapter 1, verse 9 through 11. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid them from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them, just like at, at his tomb, his empty tomb, two men standing in white, so angels, stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Acts 1, 9 through 11. So Jesus is coming back. And if there's anything that all this prophecy, all the 1,800 plus references in the Bible that tell us about Jesus' return, 
what they are meant for, it is to remind us he is coming back. There were people in the early church, and I know this is kind of a long passage to try to read there, but I highlighted the word hope because it is so vital in this. Um, There were people who were worried. They thought Jesus was coming back in their lifetime, and, and they were part of that first century church, and they thought maybe their loved ones who had died would miss out, that, they, that something else would happen to them. And so Paul, in 1 Thessalonians, he talked about that blessed hope. He said, brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. If you're not a follower of Jesus, you have no hope. The other faiths that have a founder whose grave you can go visit, they do not have the hope of seeing those loved ones again. Verse 14, for we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep, the saints who had already died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then, here's our blessed hope. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Encourage one another with these words. Hope. Give each other hope because of what the Lord has promised. He's not going to leave us. It is not his intention for us to go through these things. But if we have a hope, we should also be led to do something about it. Jesus didn't say just hide out in your bunker and wait and watch all these awful things happening. He said to do a couple of things. Um, the first is just the admonition that he gave right before he went up the first time and, and went to heaven. Um, he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. So it's clear he wanted us to keep doing that uh, until his coming, to, to basically do that until he returns, to read as many people as possible. But another thing um, in the book of 1 John, the, the, the three short epistles right before Revelation in the Bible, um, John, by this point, he was an older man, and, and he was trying to encourage the, the Christian church of that time. And he talked about that word hope. All who have this hope in him, in Jesus, purify themselves just as he is pure. If you know that your boss is coming to your cubicle to check to see what you're doing, does your cubicle look a little nicer that day? If you know that... Um, you know, your family member, Aunt Bertha, who's sometimes a little bit more persnickety about, you know, your living room when she comes to visit, you might go around and do a little extra dusting and a little extra cleaning, and you might pull a few books off the shelf so that that doesn't look cluttered. You're going to maybe do some things differently. And if we know that Jesus is returning, it should cause us to live our lives in such a way that we, that we are ready for his, his return. And when we see all these events that can be frightening, if you don't know that Jesus told us, hey, don't worry, fear not. Um, I'm telling you these things so that you don't have to be in fear. You know, if you remember that, that his return is imminent, it could be at any time. I don't think there's anything that has to be fulfilled in, in prophecy for Jesus to return that has not already happened. And I know people get into different arguments about pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib, amillennial, premillennial, stuff like that. I think the Bible's pretty clear if you just read it for what it says and that Jesus holds this out as a blessed hope because he wants us to know that he is returning. Um, and so if we know he's returning, we're going to try to live our lives in a different way because he, he, could, he could come back today. And if he does, I want to make sure that I'm, I'm ready to meet him. Um, One passage that I just love that just ties this all together is from Luke chapter 21. I didn't put it in your bulletin, but um, it's the end of the Luke passage of the of the um, on the Mount of Olives when he was talking about all those things. He said, "When these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near." When I watched those rapture movies when I was a kid, they terrified me. They didn't make me want to stand up and lift up my head and watch for my redemption. They 
struck fear into my heart. Now, I, I do feel like when I truly gave my heart to the Lord, a lot of that sort of went away, but it took me a while to recognize that Jesus' return is a 100% positive thing for the believer. It's not something we should live and worry about. We should stand up, lift up our heads because our redemption is drawing near. When we see weird, wild things happening in other parts of the world, or even if it ever were to happen, you know, some of those things were to happen on our shores here in the United States, we should still be able to look to Jesus, have hope, and recognize that he said, hey, I'm, I'm telling you this stuff so that you won't be in fear like everybody else will be. And so just that passage, when these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Luke 21, 28. I'm not saying that I think that, that you know, we're having any specific thing happening tomorrow or a month from now or anything. I'm only saying today that we should have hope because Jesus said when you see things happen that match with what's in the Bible, that should not cause you a spirit of fear, but instead to watch for my return. We should see it as a, a positive, hope-filled thing. Now, if you have loved ones who don't know the Lord, you're probably finding yourself praying more that they would come to know the Lord, but you don't know. Maybe it's through some of these kinds of things that they will recognize their need for Jesus and will come to, to know the Lord. And um, relating to that in Titus, that last verse we read at the very beginning, it's the top part on your bulletin um, notes, it says, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Jesus said, when you see these things start to happen, look up, your redemption draws near. And then Titus writing, you know, a couple decades later said, that thing Jesus talked about, that's the blessed hope. That's the thing the believers have to look forward to, the return of Jesus. Many of them thought he would do so in their lifetime. I consider it the fact that Jesus has waited 2,000 years to return is because he's trying to reach as many people as possible. And, and the Bible may not exactly articulate this thought, but I've always kind of felt when the last person who he is going to reach and is going to get saved is saved, there's no reason for him to to, to hold back. Jesus in his earthly ministry did not know when he was going to return. He said, only the Father knows. I don't even know. Um, but I'm telling you, he is trying to save every single person who can possibly be saved. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. So he's the blessed hope that's coming back soon. He is just, I, I, I would say, um, watching for that opportunity where anyone who is ever going to come to know him will come to know him and that's what what Titus is is saying here there's also in first Thessalonians something very similar that calls it the blessed hope the blessed hope of the Christian um, that we don't have to be in fear when the world around us is in fear we don't have to be nervous and scared about the events happening we can instead say well Jesus said stuff would happen I'm just going to make sure that I'm ready no matter what. So if he returns, then I'm ready for him. Because if, even if the worst happens, we still have Jesus. And that's really all that we need. So don't forget this very last thing on your bulletin. It says, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. We still have Jesus. God is still on the throne. God was not surprised by what happened with Iran and Israel yesterday. God's not surprised what might happen next week or a month from now, um, and he foresaw it from the very beginning. He uh, is not having anything sneak up on him, so we do not have to be in fear and, and worry that somehow something will escape his notice, uh, because God is on the throne and Jesus is coming back. And all God's people said, amen. amen. All right, we're going to end with a hymn that kind of ties this thought together. Song 420 says, in times like these, if you want to stand with me, in times like these, you need a savior. In times like these, you need an anchor. The, the world has nothing that it can rely on in the way that we can rely on the Lord and know that no matter what happens, and I didn't even get into Revelation and any of that other way deeper stuff. I just looked at a few things in Ezekiel and um, in Psalm 83 and Isaiah 17, but those are things we see forming that could happen even in our lifetime or even in the very near future, and as you see that, the world is freaking out, but we don't have to freak out because in times like these, we have a Savior. Let's sing just the first verse, and then we'll close in prayer. times 
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have a hope. We thank you that you are our blessed hope, our anchor that the world does not have. And I can only imagine if I did not have you in the times that we are in, just that it would feel very worrisome and I would be filled with doubt and concern. But knowing that you, you are the one that you are returning someday. You are the one that we can look forward to your return and know that you are still in control, that you still have the power in our world today and in anything that may unfold down the the line. I pray that you would help each one here today, Lord, as we've talked about hope, have that hope. Whatever's going on in their personal lives, maybe right now they're feeling a little hopeless or concerned about other things, whether it's health or maybe a family member that's straying or whatever it might be, I just pray that you would drop that hope into their heart, help them to just rely on you, to give it to you, and to know that you are still in control. I pray that you would watch over um, those of us who have um, illness right now, aren't able to be here. I pray that you would be with our pastor and his wife, and all those, Lord, who are part of our community, that you would uh, just uh, be with them, whatever Uh, situations or circumstances they might be in. But help us just take away from today the hope that lies within us because of you. The hope for today, the hope for tomorrow, and the fact that you, you, Jesus Christ, are our blessed hope. Thank you again for being here with us today. And we ask this in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. Thank you so much for being here today.